This is Just a Thought, episode number 35. Needing, wanting, and waiting. Hello! So, just like anything else, now that I have a better understanding of the CTFAR model, I see it around me everywhere. I have a better idea of why people are motivated to do certain things and not others. And I have a better idea of why I do things and not others. <laughs> it is like other laws. It's like gravity. Once you've been taught the concept, you can start to recognize it for what it is. For example, I know that if I let go of an object in my hand, it falls every time, unless it's glued to my hand. <laughs> And when I was younger, I learned about gravity and realized, oh, that's what it's called when this happens, right? When I drop the thing, gravity pulls and it falls. And as I start to understand gravity, I can use its laws as well as other ones. And I can learn to fly huge planes and they don't get pulled to the ground. Similarly, as I learn to make my thoughts intentional, I know I can change my mind and change my life exponentially, and so can you, which is the whole point of all of this. I'm not at the point where I can fly an airplane, so to speak, with my thoughts, but I am learning how it works, which is pretty exciting. So speaking of seeing the model, I was reading The Frog and Toad Stories by Arnold Lobel. They have always been some of my favorite stories. I love, love, love them. So my daughter and I were reading The Garden, Frog and Toad Story. And just in case you haven't read it, I'll read it for you today. I love this story. It's pretty short. So after I read it, I'll explain how the model applies and what it has to do with our needs, wants, and things we're waiting for. Here it goes. A frog was in his garden. Toad came walking by. What a fine garden you have, frog, he said. Yes, said frog. It is very nice. But it was hard work. I wish I had a garden, said Toad. Here are some flower seeds. Plant them in the ground, said Frog. Soon you will have a garden. How soon, asked Toad. Quite soon, said Frog. Toad ran home. He planted the flower seeds. Now seeds, said Toad. Start growing. Toad walked up and down a few times. The seeds did not start to grow. Toad put his head close to the ground and said loudly, Now seeds, start growing. Toad looked at the ground again. The seeds did not start to grow. Toad put his head very close to the ground and shouted, Now seeds, start growing. Frog came running up the path. What is all this noise? he asked. My seeds will not grow, said Toad. You're shouting too much, said Frog. These poor seeds are afraid to grow. My seeds are afraid to grow? asked Toad. Of course, said Frog. Leave them alone a few days. Let the sun shine on them. Let the rain fall on them. Soon your seeds will start to grow. That night, Toad looked out of his window. Drat, said Toad. My seeds have not started to grow. They must be afraid of the dark. Toad went out to his garden with some candles. I will read my seeds a story, said Toad. Then they will not be afraid. Toad read a long story to his seeds. All the next day, Toad sang songs to his seeds. And all the next day, Toad read poems to his seeds. And all the next day, Toad played music for his seeds. Toad looked at the ground. The seeds still did not start to grow. What shall I do? cried Toad. These must be the most frightened seeds in the whole world. Then Toad felt very tired, and he fell asleep. Toad, Toad, wake up, said Frog. Look at your garden. Toad looked at his garden. Little green plants were coming up out of the ground. At last, shouted Toad, my seeds have stopped being afraid to grow. And now you will have a nice garden too, said Frog. Yes, said Toad, but you were right, Frog. It was very hard work. And that's the end. 
I love how Frog and Toad show us that the good and beautiful things in others' lives are possible for us to have too. We needn't ever feel jealous. That's not what God wants us to do. And thinking jealous thoughts always motivate feeling miserable. Instead of feeling jealous, I recommend feeling inspired by others' success. Anything is possible for us too, just like Toad. Some of life is given to us. Some of it we choose. But even if we were born in Utah, we can still move to Texas or Hawaii or Alaska if we choose. It might be easier and faster for someone living in Louisiana, for example, to move to Texas. But it's still possible for someone in Utah to do too. It just might take a little more time and money and hard work, but it's not impossible. Believing it's possible and our attitudes toward it, our feelings and thoughts about it, how we show up and move forward are in our control. Have you ever seen that picture of an iceberg where you see that big iceberg floating on top of the water? It's what's underneath the part that we can see underneath the water is a foundation of things holding up the iceberg, right? With an iceberg, it's just mountains of ice. But when it comes to success, what we see in others is the iceberg. We see their success. What is underneath it, the foundation is lots of perseverance, failure, sacrifice, disappointment, good habits, dedication. People don't usually see that unless they're looking for it or really looking hard. As we start working on thought work and we begin changing our actions, it sometimes takes a while for the seeds of thought to bloom, but they will bloom. We will see the results of the thoughts that we tend to. Sometimes we might realize we planted a weed instead of a flower. And unless you're looking to make dandelion tea, you can choose to pull out any weeds, depending on what you want your life's garden to look like. For example, I used to worry a lot about the condition of my house. You've heard about it in my podcast, and I talk about it a lot because it bothered me for a long time. And I feel like I'm not alone as a mom and a parent in worrying about the state of my house. I was like Toad, and I noticed that some people I knew didn't always have piles of stuff everywhere. They didn't have to do a chaos cleanup. Remember Fly Lady? Chaos stands for can't let anyone over syndrome. I saw people who didn't have to do that fear-driven cleanup every time someone came over. It didn't take them two hours to prepare for someone to come and visit, or, or longer, right? And I wanted a different result than I currently had. Fly Lady gave me some seeds, and my friends gave me some seeds, seeds of thought, and I planted them. I had a desire. I wanted them to bloom. I wanted the result of a tidy home. I imagined what it would be like to have a tidy house with beautiful things in it. And slowly, so slowly, I started to change. And there was a time I felt like I needed to. I felt like my life as it was, was unacceptable. The truth was, I didn't need a clean house. If I really, truly needed it, I would have died without it. God would have provided it, or I would have sacrificed all I had to get it. That's what we actually do for things we need. We make them happen, or we die. (laughs) But need is one of those tricky words that gets thrown around a lot. I need my kids to help. I need my spouse to be more romantic. I need more love and understanding. I need this job. I need to lose weight. And so we hold our minds hostage to this thought that even though we kind of believe it's true, there's another big part of us that doesn't believe it too. Because we know we don't really need those things. We may really, really want them, but we don't need them. And when we open our minds to that, And we loosen all that cement around the thought, it helps it to grow. But chances are, if we take the thought and plant it like Toad did, it's going to start growing. Even if we shout at it or feel impatient because we think it's a need when it's not, it's growing already. As we relax into it and just trust that it can happen, I can have a tidy house. 
and keep showing up and moving towards it, it will grow. Worry doesn't help it grow. Impatience doesn't help it grow. But it will probably grow despite those things anyway. So I wanted a tidy, beautiful home. I planted the desire in my mind and I started to move forward. I started to set a 15 minute timer and that of course helped a little, but I really didn't feel like those 15 minute sessions even put a dent in my mess. And I felt so impatient. I worried that I was doing all this work for nothing, that I would always have messes to clean up. And in some ways I wasn't wrong. I've learned that living is messy. And a stall is only clean if the farmer sells his horse. But if we want to have a horse and we want to actually live, there will probably be a mess. But as I've become more intentional, I've learned often I can choose when I make a mess, how big I want to make it, and that when I make a mess, and if someone else makes a mess that for some reason I'm responsible to clean up, I can clean it up. It's not an emotional thing. When my kids or their friends or my nieces and nephews dump their juice out or get out papers or throw crayons everywhere, it's okay. I know what to do with a mess. I clean it up. I can also ask them to clean it up. I can ask someone else to clean it up. I can hire someone else to clean it up. Or I can leave it there. Not a big deal. Somehow, over the years, I've realized that my desire to have a clean, beautiful home is a want, not a need. And I'm okay when it gets messy. I do want to be clean, so I've come up with days and times and routines and habits that support what I want, and I get help in cleaning it. But what's funny is I've changed. These days, I'll do all the dishes without realizing I've done them. And then I'll thank my husband for doing them. And he'll say, I didn't do them. I think you did them. This isn't always true. Sometimes he actually does do them. But what's funny is I used to think it was so hard to do the dishes. Growing up, I was the kid who used to lay down and cry and spend two hours talking about how I didn't want to do the dishes instead of just doing them in five minutes, right? And now I just do them without thinking about it. And the times are few and far between that it takes longer than 15 minutes to get ready for company at our house. I still have piles. I might always have piles. But there's a lot less piles than there used to be. And that's the point. It's the acknowledging the difference between a want and a need and holding myself hostage to an impossible expectation under the premise of, I need this. One more story. I was out for a run one day and I saw an older woman out in her driveway standing next to a moving truck and she was limping along trying to carry a box out of her garage to the moving truck and I thought, she is moving. Is there anyone helping her? I slowed my run down and I watched and I observed that she was all alone trying to move and it was a hot, sweaty Texas evening during COVID. I realized she probably didn't have help, but I felt like I wanted to help her. I wanted her to have help, so I stopped running and I asked if she was moving and if I could help. And she said, yeah, she was moving. She had been in the hospital for months, very sick, and she had almost died. She had just gotten out and she wasn't supposed to lift things, but she was trying to move to be closer to family in California. And I felt so glad I had stopped. And I called on some other friends from my church and a huge group of people showed up. I was so happy. And we found when she opened her garage that this was a different job than we had planned for. Her garage was trashed. There were piles and piles of things, papers, books, CDs, movies, collectible cards, toys, but none of it had been stored properly. It wasn't organized. It was in piles like the garage. It was like the garage was a giant trash can that everything had just been thrown into. And there were old pictures all over and loose change, and I felt sick. The pictures weren't in books, and the picture and the the money were just scattered everywhere. She told us that she couldn't take everything with her, and there wasn't room in her little U-Haul. She was just trying to find a few special things to put in her truck and take with her. So we started to help her move things around and sort through it, 
So much of it was damaged and moldy and dirty. It was so sad. And she seemed so embarrassed. She kept apologizing and saying things like, my kids came for a short while while I was in the hospital to help and they brought everything from the house into the garage and such a mess. She seemed so ashamed and I felt bad for her. I realized I was thinking I'd feel so embarrassed if I was her. Have my stuff so neglected, so messy all over the place. And I prayed, please God, help me never to end up in a mess like this. And God gently spoke back to me in my mind. He said, why not? It wouldn't change your worth. And I felt humbled. I realized yet again that our circumstances do not reflect or affect our worth. It doesn't change. And if I ever end up in a mess like that, my stuff scattered and damaged, it's okay. It doesn't change my worth or yours. When we really begin to understand that what we actually need is very little, things really come into perspective. So, as we make goals and have hopes and dreams for ourselves or our families, I'd like to recommend that we make them wants, not needs. And then, as these thoughts and ideas start to bloom, we'll appreciate them rather than feeling entitled to them. It's all a gift. This is Christina Stead. I'm a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and a disciple of Jesus Christ. He loves you. He loves me. And he loves us. This is Just a Thought, a podcast for parents ready to change their mind and change their lives.